This video made possible by Killer Visual Strategies. Visit KillerVisualStrategies.com. I'm very excited to moderate this very dynamic panel. And we're here to talk about how we build impactful organizations. And in the context of what we're discussing today, impactful means obviously doing well financially, inclusive, dynamic, having an impact on your organization, but also an impact on the community as well. So I'm very honored to be here with these amazing leaders. And when I think about my professional journey, it was anything but linear. I thought I knew what I wanted to do in college. I did something else. I took my first job. I went on. I ended up in business and politics and back here in the nonprofit sector for business advocacy. So I'm going to ask Anamari and Jesse to share with us what their leadership journey was and how they got where they got today. So we'll start with you, Anamari. Well, I, I think as, as you said, you know, you look on it backwards and it all makes sense. But as you're going forward, it's anything but clear. Um, I actually am now, I'm the 33rd president of the University of Washington, and I'm in my 33rd year as a faculty <laughs> member at the University of Washington, so I think it's kind of special. Um, and uh, some of you knew me as an assistant professor, and I don't think anyone would have thought that I'd be here, and I'm, I mean that um, seriously. Uh, you know, I entered the academy a lot because I'm a child clinical psychologist, work primarily with adolescents at risks, and that was the area in which I really wanted to make a difference. I wanted to give back um, to the community, and I wanted to work with kids like I had been, where the path to success was anything but um, predictable. And you know, sometimes I get asked by people, how did you get here? And my answer is somewhat, say yes a lot. I mean, I think in life, most of us will have a lot of opportunities that come our way. And I think you have to have the courage and to, because they won't always work out, but to say yes. And so when opportunities, when people did come to me to be you know, director of clinical training in, in my department, I was at that point brand newly tenured, or when we had a department that was really having difficulties and they asked me would I step in, that was kind of a risky situation, you kind of say yes. Um, because it's the right thing to do. And pretty much those yeses start taking you along a particular path. And, you know, for me, I view what I'm doing now as in, in some ways very much an extension. I mean, I can see why what I'm doing now is so similar to what I wanted to do, which is, you know, making sure that pathways of opportunity are open to a broad range of youth, and in some cases, not so young people um, that are coming to um, the university. So, like I say, it all seems linear, um, and everything, you know, you get more and more responsibility one step after another, but at the time, every step is kind of scary. Every step is a leap, but you do it. I would say the punchline from that for me is there are opportunities that will present themselves. Yes. And sometimes you just have to say yes and kind of take a deep breath and dive in and see what happens. Exactly. And you know, and, and have confidence in yourself that you'll figure it out. Right. Jesse? You know, I get this question a lot and I really don't know how to answer it oftentimes. I'd say that my career leadership pathway is one of planned happenstance. You know, I'm a daughter of immigrants, and I remember growing up and saying, I don't know if I should, you know, try to be head of X or president of Y. And my parents would say, well, why not you? And I thought, well, why not me? So it was just about having a point of view that you could do anything you wanted to do. And one of the things that draws me to this work is that there are a lot of children who don't have that right. perspective. So really the difference between me and someone who doesn't have as much, who might look like me, is great shepherding and parenting mm -hmm. and access to great opportunity, educational opportunity or career opportunity. And if we don't fix the access to opportunity, then our democracy, I think, is going to be negatively impacted. So I think um, the, the, the leadership journey 
is about exploration of things that you're curious about. Resiliency from failures, unanticipated failures, and then luck. A lot of it is luck, oh, yeah. whatever zip code you happen to be born in. Right. Well, and, and I would also say that the political, social, and economic systems in which the three of us operate don't always welcome us into positions of authority and leadership. Yeah. Yes, none of us are leaders out of central right. casting. Exactly. <laughs> but maybe we'll be changing what central right. casting no, looks and, like. And, and, <laughs> And the one thing I will say too is that, you know, we often talk about wanting a seat at the table, and I would say that you two are examples of, yes, a seat at the table, but the head of the table, because that should be attainable for anyone as well. Mm. So it's a big step forward to just not be lunch. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a cornerstone of how organizations can be successful. And we know that there are organizations in this room at various stages in your life cycle. You know, you come from a university that's a century and a half old. You come from kind of a relatively startup mode, 13 years old, I think your company is. So talk about how you're able to instill those values of diversity, equity, inclusion in your organization and the relationship you have with your board or your board of regents to make that happen. We'll start with you, Jesse. So I think sometimes people, when they, leaders, when they think about diversity, they think about something they should try to manage. How do we manage diversity? How do we get more people of color? How do we get more women? Those are really great outcomes. But I think until you have a shift in point of view from managing diversity to actually leveraging mm -hmm. diversity, you're gonna be in a d deficit framework. Right. And so we try to see diversity as something to leverage, something that we want to lean into. An asset. It's an asset. And so if we don't have women or people of color at the table, will we build as empathetic a product mm -hmm. that children who are children of color or women in the education system would not enjoy as much? So we feel like it's a success requirement to have diverse voices. We also have a value at Dreambox which is called benevolent friction. <laughs> we like to be hard on ideas and soft on people. And that means that you have to subordinate your ego and think everybody there is trying to work really hard to make sure that every child, every child's potential can be un unleashed. And if you don't have a diverse setting, and you don't have kind of an ability to subordinate that ego, a good idea may never become a great idea. And so to the last point you asked about the board, I think setting expectations about the board, so I still have one open board seat at Dreambox <laughs> because I've been reluctant to fill it with another white man. Yeah. And even though I'm a woman person of color, that's not enough because I'm the operator. And so it's almost a year since, my, since the transaction and I still, hint ladies, have an opening that I am com I'm committed to having a person of color or a woman in. And on Amari, you know, we, we talked a bit with Jesse about diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity and background, but also too, I think, especially at a university, diversity of thought and background and different types of people with different life experiences, even different political views, God forbid. So talk a bit about that, adding on to what Jesse just well, said. Well, and also I think it's really important in terms of socioeconomic status as yes, well. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and the whole spectrum. I mean, one of the things that we've been seeing at universities is, you know, what, I, what numerous people call the barbell effect, that you have folks at the very wealthy and then you also have the very low income in the middle classes being hauled, hollowed out. Right. You know, I mean, following along, Jesse, I think that what's really important in terms of getting buy-in to the importance of diversity in all of these ways is that it's not just morally the right thing to do, although it absolutely is, but getting people to buy into the fact that it's absolutely core to excellence. Yep. That the more ideas you have at the table, and you know, we do come, you know, our backgrounds do shape what perspectives right we bring to the table. That you know, it creates the environment from which good ideas will sift up um, and other ideas will fall out. You know, I think that you know, when I meet with my closest staff, I tell them, come at me hard. Yeah. You know, I want to know everything that's wrong with this idea. <laughs> so that by the time I go out, it's not that the, first of all, the idea and the process is better, 
but at least I know what questions I'm going to be asked. Mm -hmm. And it really is important to have those different viewpoints. I mean, at times it creates tension. There's no question. It doesn't always make things easier. But I think I, I like that, that, that what you said, Jesse, about the friction. friction. Be, you know, right, be, be soft on people, but you know, hard on ideas. And I think that you can't have a truly excellent environment when there is homogeneity. And you know, a university, at the end of the day, excellence is so important to what we do. And so when I was, I mean, when I became interim president, one of the first things I did was I um, launched a race equity and inclusion initiative because, and it was kind of risky to do. I was interim president. Quite frankly, I kind of figured that if this didn't work out, it would tell me that I didn't want the interim to be removed from the, from the name. Our regents, I have to say, have been so supportive. They have their own diversity um, and inclusion committee where they're looking at these issues, um, not just in terms of faculty and students, but also in terms of staff. And in terms of, you know, um, how are we doing our leasing? Um, how are we doing our building? Who are we bringing onto our campus? But absolutely, this is critical to excellence, not just to it's the right thing to do. May I add something? Please, you? absolutely. So there's a, a lawyer who focuses on social justice. You might know his name is Brian Stevenson. And he had a phrase, I heard him speak once, which has stuck with me said, proximity is the pathway to deeper understanding, and deeper understanding is the pathway to empathy. And what that translates to me, and it's not the diverse candidate's responsibility to enlighten yes. the majority. Right. We have to go out of our way to be proximate to the other so that we can understand the other and we can be more empathetic to the other. So if you look around your organizations and all you see is you, then you need to do more to get proximate to something that doesn't look like you. If you look around your organization, uh, sorry, if you look into your social media and all you see is a mirror of you, then you need to become more proximate to the other. And I was re reflecting on this and as a woman of color, I'm always thinking about what I have to do to help the majority mm -hmm. understand me better. And thinking the majority has to do so much work. And then when I took a look at my social media right. and I saw me, mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, he was talking about me. Right. I have to do more. Right. Absolutely. I have to do more. I have to yeah. intentionally diversify uh, the people that I am in connection with. And so what somebody recommended was go into your Facebook or go into your whatever it is. Instagram, your echo chamber, that's what I call it. Your, go into your echo chamber. And take <laughs> 20 people yeah. and eliminate them and they go out and find 20 people who are not like you, right. or not like the people that you just took out, and add them, and follow them, and get proximate to them, and try to understand them, you might find that your recruiting efforts become more diverse mm -hmm. as well. Well, what I think is, is really interesting, I was at a conference recently with a number of university presidents from around the campus, and quite frankly, also from around the country, but also from Asia, et cetera, and people were talking about, um, they're deans, and you know, there were some, well, I have two deans that are women, or I have, and I went back and I looked, and half our deans are now women, yeah. um, and almost a third are people of color. Yes. <laughs> and and I, I can tell you that is extremely Rare. unusual. Yeah. And I do think that it's partly that you get the snowballing effect. Yeah. I know that it's easier for us to, in fact, recruit yeah. women because I'm at the right. head. And so, you know, I, I do think that you create a snowball effect mm -hmm. that, you know, as you bring in, because, you know, it's uncomfortable to be the only one. Yeah. You know, I, I often bring up the example of uh, probably about 10 years ago, there was a front page article in the New York Times magazine um, that was really about how uncomfortable it was to be a white basketball player. You know, and it's like when you are the only one and you're a white male, you get the cover of the New York Times. <laughs> Welcome to our world. I know, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and it is, I mean, you know, it is sometimes, you know, it can be a very uncomfortable position yeah. where, you know, and, and so, you know, when you start having a setting that, hey, I'm not going to be the only, hey, I've got, you know, so diversity begets diversity, and it really becomes a recruiting tool in and of itself. 
that's an interesting article because I suspect if someone white plays in the NBA, it's probably had some experience around diverse audiences. Yes. So it's kind of interesting. So when we talk about inclusion in these conversations, this is really about building stronger organizations. Yes. You talked about the fact that you have people who are making decisions and having input that get you a stronger product. But talk a bit about you know, the responsibility you have. You know, for example, you have a startup company and you want to be profitable. You want to attract more funding in the next round. Talk about how those things affect your ability to be more effective at attracting the, the capital that you need to build. So another value we have at Dreambox is do well in order to do good. Do well in order to do good. Because in the education space, there are people who are in it who have reservations about being for profit. Yeah. But I have no apologies for being for profit. I can attract the best talent. I can create value, lasting value. And so a sustainable company that is growing is the best way we can maximize our impact on learning and really, frankly, shape the future of learning. And so I think that's part of our ethos and part of our philosophy, do well in order to do good. And when people understand that there's a discipline and a commitment to doing well, people like to be affiliated with success. Sure. You know, people appreciate the ability to be affiliated with, with success, even when it's hard. Mm -hmm. And so in our space where in education and educating young people, even when you're successful, it's still really, really hard. You can be successful for 10 years, right. and in the 11th year, it's still gonna be really, really hard. And so when we recruit people, we ask them, what is that thing that you love to do that even when it's, where you're really, really successful, it still can be really hard, and the prospects of success mm -hmm. are low. If you can get excited about that, then Dreambox is the place for you. Interesting. So one of the things that I hear often in the business world, but especially in the tech world, is that it's hard to find qualified local talent, which is why we have to import folks and recruit people from outside the country. And you run a higher education institution and you supply the pipeline of talent. You actually are hiring people all the time. And so talk a bit about what we need to do here at home locally so that populations who live here and have been here for a while get access to these high wage jobs and opportunities. Well, I mean, to, to state the obvious, invest in higher education. <laughs> I mean, we have an incredibly, you know, talented group of young people in our local high schools, elementary schools, et cetera. And, you know, we have some great universities. I and mean, obviously, you know, the University of Washington were the biggest, but we have great community colleges, community and technical colleges, you know, um, you know, this, this is not the Apple Cup week, so I can say it. Wazoo is a great place, <laughs> yes. no question. I mean, there we have, you know, absolutely wonderful universities that do a good job of graduating talent. And, you know, this year we, we you know, we really, I have to thank the legislature. They did invest in higher ed, right. and the business community played a big role in that investment. Yep. But, you know, we have the talent here. You know, I don't think it's always, you know, I hate it when you pit one against the other. Right. I actually think that bringing in some people from abroad is a good thing, too. Oh, I agree. Because, you know, I mean, if you, if you are from Washington State, even if you never live more than 50 miles away from your home, if you work for Dreambox, if you work for Starbucks, if you work for Microsoft, if you work for Google, you're going to be working with people from all over the world. Right. You're probably going to be traveling abroad. So having an education where you're also sitting side by side from people from other countries can be a good thing. Oh, immigration is good for the economy. Make no um, mistake. As an immigrant, you know, it's worked for me. <laughs> and me as well. <laughs> but, but I do think that, you know, that, that, that we do have a lot of really good local talent. Um, we, you know, we are still, compared to other states, we do well once they enter higher ed, but we have a much lower percentage of our high school students that are entering higher education than in other states, and we have to do better. So Jesse, so, you work in the tech space. Do you think there's a bias with some companies who only want Ivy League graduates from really prestigious schools and they kind of overlook some really amazing talent from state schools? So That's a loaded question, I know, sorry. I kind of feel garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Um, at, at Dreambox, we try to give people real problems that we're struggling with and facing in technology, say, and we ask them how they would go about solving it. Mm -hmm. And then we let them, tech, technical hires, we let them go home 
and then submit their recommendation to us afterwards. And people say, why did you do that? They could go and they could ask for help and they could refer to other people. And it's like, well, isn't that what they're gonna do when they come to Dreambox? Right. We want people who are resourceful. We want people who can harness collective wisdom. Yeah. We want people who are industrious and resilient and who are curious and who ask great questions. Right. And if we find that at, from Harvard, great. If we find that from you know, Bellevue College, great. Yeah. We, so I think there's something else. We, I think the higher ed piece is a really important piece, but there are two other things that I think are important on this. One is we can't be satisfied if the K through 12 experience in public education is different for, for students of color than it is for the majority. That's so true. And right now, if you take a look at Seattle Public Schools, yep. when you take a look at the experience the typical white child has, you could say it was a different district than the experience of the, the, the typical experience of a student of color. That is unacceptable and it's not good business. So that's one thing. The second thing I would say is we have to think about talent, not only in terms of their skills and experiences, but these are people with families. We've got to be very intentional about how it is to live in the greater Seattle area. And what are we gonna do to keep people in the greater Seattle area? Cost of living, public transportation, these things aren't sexy, but when, you, when you're a customer service right. rep, and you make $65,000 a year, and you live in Bellevue, yeah. something's gonna give. Right. And if you don't have public transportation so you can travel in for 45 minutes, if you're willing to do that right. every day, something's gotta give. So we should learn from other, you know, I was in the Bay Area before I came here. We should learn from the lessons of the Bay Area. We should make sure that Seattle doesn't become a place that only techies that uh, have a certain profile thrive in. We have to, if, if we give up on our middle class, then we will yes. give up on so many cultural things that make this place so special. Yeah, I think it's important not to, um, to differentiate between a pedigree and a degree. Right. And I think that sometimes, you know, there are folks who just think a pedigree, in other words, a, right. a degree, that that means everything. And, you know, and, and, and look, there are great, great individuals, great, great students in schools across yep. the world. But one thing that I, that, that, that I can tell you is, you know, and sometimes, you know, as people are making up their minds and trying to decide where to go, I've, I've said this to parents and students before, the world is big in public, not small in private. <laughs> right. And I think that for a student to have done well and to have risen to the top in a big, public university means that they have learned to navigate um, a whole bunch of, um, and at times, difficult situations. Um, they don't have someone holding their hand, which I do think that you, know, you get your hand held a lot more. And in fact, that's sometimes what's attractive to some people about a private school. And in the short run, it can be attractive, but in the long run, sometimes when they get out of the setting, where their hand has been held at every step of the way, they can be lost. I, I give my niece as an example. She's a screenwriter in LA, very successful in a very, very hard business. Mm -hmm. um, she went to UW. Um, she was gonna be an English major. Uh, she had a scholarship at a small private, and quite frankly at the time, this was about 20 years ago, I thought she should go. She didn't because she had wanted to go to UW her own life, her niece was going there, et cetera. I'd say her first year was maybe a little tougher at UW than it might have been at, at a smaller school. We actually are doing a lot better um, right now with the Husky experience. We have first year programs. We didn't at the time. But by her second year, she found her niche, she found her group, et cetera. She was able to leave the UW. This is a shy kid. This is my spouse's side of the family. Um, she, you know, she's a, she was a shy young woman. She was able to get in a car with all her belongings, drive to Hollywood, find a part-time job, volunteer at a studio, and stop, not, start knocking on doors. She would have never, I asked her actually, where do you learn to do that? She said, well, I had to do this to find an advisor for my senior thesis. She would have never learned to do that, I think, in a private school. Um, and so, you know, I do think that when employers are thinking about the skills that students are bringing to the table, um, I would actually give a bigger boost to the kid who's made their way through a more complicated, more diverse setting that's actually a lot closer to what the real world looks like. 
So let's talk a bit about education in, in the space that you're both in. So when we talk about education, especially higher ed and recruiting, there is a tendency to think about a very certain demographic that trends younger. But we know that we have people of all ages and talents throughout the entire talent pipeline. And sometimes there are people who may be changing careers during their mid-career or want to do something different, and they wouldn't fall into the category of young. So totally going off script here, can you very briefly give me your thoughts on how we address that issue? And I'll start with you, Jesse. So I'm old at Dreambox, you know. <laughs> you know, you have these young startup uh, companies, but when I think about all of the mistakes I made at Blackboard and Kaplan and Leapfrog, these are all the mistakes that I learned from that Dreambox doesn't have to experience. And so I think we have to think, my, my dad says, um, we can't help, what does he say? We can't help getting older, but we can help getting old. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that you are constantly learning, you're curious, and you stay proximate to emerging things. So someone who is intellectually curious at 25 is still intellectually curious at 45 and 55. Exactly. And so how do you harness talent exactly. from everyone? And so I think culturally you have to make sure that you are a place that values and touts different thinking and innovation and difference is de defined by difference. And so big D diversity, right. including age. Right. And so we have the whole spectrum yeah. at Dreambox Learning. We really want people to come and add to the fabric. I think the way this country has thought about diversity historically has been in terms of a melting pot. Yeah. And I like to think of it in terms of a quilt. Yep. You know. Every color is needed, every fabric is needed, every stitch is needed. And they all stand out. And they all stand out. And they all have something and they add something to that quilt. And that quilt is stronger and it can give more comfort and warmth because it's a quilt instead of a melting pot. Anamari. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because I was just uh, <laughs> sitting down with my office last week um, with a young woman of 50, mm -hmm. um, right around 50, who had transferred in from Bellevue right. College. Um, and was, you know, talking about, you know, all the things and all the leadership opportunities, a young woman of color that she wanted. And I was like, whoa, she is terrific. And I think it's important that the, the majority of our students are what you might call, quote, typical college right. age. But when you have, you know, 50,000 students, there are a lot of students that are returning students right. that are coming back. Um, I love it. Every once in a while you get someone that, uh, you know, usually a woman that's coming back together with her children. Right. Now that her children are growing and going to college, they're both going to college. Yeah. Uh, one of our, a uh, couple of years ago, one of our oldest graduates was in their 80s. And we also have a program where, I think it's over 62 or so, you can come back and take classes. And we have a lot of, and I can tell you that faculty love it when they have these, quote, older students right. with um, more real-world experience that they can bring to the table, what they add to the discussion. Right. Often they actually become mentors to some of the younger students, but, but I agree, at the end of the day, old is a mindset, not just, um, you know, age is just a number. Right. And what you want is people that are open to different experiences, that are willing to get outside their comfort zone regardless of what age they are. And we have, we have a lot of, I mean, nowadays we know that um, you know, the typical student is going to have not just one career, but two, three, four careers. And, you know, we do have more people that are coming back, not necessarily for a second degree, although some are, but for an additional credential. Um, and I think that more and more our life is going to be yeah. about lifelong learning. Yeah. And I think what you're talking about is agility because, I mean, I come from the generation where a lot of my friends have had the same job, the same company for a long time. Because I was in marketing, I was always in peril every three or four years. But I think depending on what field you're in, you know, let's talk about today's economy. People need to be generalists, they need to be agile. And talk about how you have a group of people now who are being educated and how do, how do we help instill that, that they have to be flexible and agile but really be good at something. How, how do you do all those things to be relevant in an economy? So this is so important to me. Okay. So people ask, why did you start with math? And why is math so important? Math is important. You guys know all the STEM. Everyone here has, doesn't have to hear that. But I actually believe that what we're doing at Dreambox is helping kids to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. We are living in an economy that is information-driven, is globalized, 
and we don't even know the impact of AI and machine learning. Right. We don't know what, we what don't know. industries are going to exist in the future, right. let alone what jobs. And so I think it's fleeting for us to say education should figure out a way to teach kids what they need to do so that they can go work at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, we don't know what that's going to be. Right. We don't know what it, a job is going to be at Microsoft. Right. In. So when you look at a kindergartner in the face, how do you know what to prepare them for? Right. What we do know is that they have to be lifelong learners. We do know that they have to be critical thinkers. We do know that they have to be flexible thinkers. I look for nimble intelligence. And we need to make sure that kids are prepared not to thrive in that globalized um, uh, information-driven economy, but to drive it with innovation. And so they're going to get to a place in their career where they're going to have to remake their skill set over and over again. And if they approach that with joy and optimism, then great things are going to happen. If they approach it with trepidation, then bad things are going to happen. And so right, right now, I think the education, the, the purpose of education shouldn't be mastery in certain subjects. It should be to cultivate a genuine and lifelong passion for learning that cultivates general skills like you're talking about so that they can remake their skill set over and over as the landscape changes. Yeah, I have an MBA from Clark Atlanta University, which is a historically black college yeah. and university. And I had lots of different classes in the curriculum, finance, IT, you name it. And I had a communication professor. And she pulled me aside one day and she said, it doesn't matter where you go or what you do, you have to be able to communicate well. Be a good writer who can get to the point and be a clear communicator who can speak and, and have people understand what you're talking about. Yeah, one of the and things I have always just adhered to that no matter what I did in my career. Yeah, one of the things <laughs> that at times I get distressed about is when we start thinking, and, and I, I understand why, but of higher education is very narrowly vocational. Yeah. Um, look, all our students want jobs when they graduate, and I want them all to have great jobs because then they're going to be fabulous donors. Um, so there's, there's no question yeah. about the fact that I, you know, and, and we do very well. Mm -hmm. um, there was a recently a, a CNBC poll that was looking at return on investment, mm -hmm. um, and they were looking at how much you paid for college compared to your starting salaries. Yeah. Number one public university um, in the country University of Washington, Seattle, number two, University of Washington, Bothell. So we do well there. But, you know, it's really important to also prepare students for a life that's constantly changing. Yeah. Every single one of our students, including our engineering, our computer science students, et cetera, get a liberal arts degree. They have to take humanities courses that teach them how to think critically. Um, they have to develop good communication skills. They have to have good grounding in, you know, basic information technology. They have to be able, I mean, you know, information is just rushing at us all the time. And they need to be very critical about, you know, being able to weigh facts. And so I think that partly because the world is changing so rapidly, and we do need that agility, we need to have a broad-based education together with the technical skills or the particular skills, the vocational skills that you'll need. The other thing that we really focus on is that trying to build resiliency in our students. Mm. Um, we have a, a series of talks every year that are called Fail Forward. Um, I talked about my biggest failure experiences at this forum because, you know, what we get is partly because things are so competitive is students that are, that are scared to fail. And if you're going to be an innovator, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, we know that the first failure is a step towards, and the second failure and the third failure might be the step towards success. And so we want to build that resilient mindset where students are, aren't afraid to take risks because they're going to fail. But how do you learn from that and have failure be the learning um, that you need for your next step? So you know, this is something that we take absolutely seriously because it's not about preparing um, students for their first job. It's about preparing them for a life where they're going to have a first, a second, a third. I mean, I've been at the same place for 33 years, and I've held a bunch of different yeah. um, positions that have, you know, pushed me and, you know, in different ways and have drawn from different parts mm -hmm. of my skill set. 
No, and, and I would also say, you know, generally speaking, even for students who aren't college bound, is that, you know, the purpose of education is that you want them to become responsible adults who contribute positively yes. to their communities. That's the ideal. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's really what you want when it comes yeah. to education. Well, so we have about eight minutes left, and I want to ask one final question and then open up the floor to questions, too. So this is what I'm going to call the lightning round question. So when we think about technology and companies and education, we think about innovation. So very quickly, what is your definition of innovation, Jesse? Innovation is a creative endeavor that anticipates things that are not yet seen and helps you develop for the future. Well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna compete with that, which was absolutely <laughs> beautiful. But, but, but what I will say is I think it's important and it's something that we talk a lot about and that's inclusive innovation. Yes, the tech world is a, is a hotbed of innovation and that's wonderful, but we need to innovate not just in terms of technology, but we need, you know, we need innovation in the social spheres, in terms of schools, in terms of civic organizations. And when we innovate, yes, disruption can be great, but we also have to think about the communities that are being disrupted and what are our responsibilities there. So we need to just broaden that definition of innovation and where it's important. And I would say that innovation isn't necessarily something brand new. Innovation sometimes is having the political will and the courage to do what you know you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So um, with that said, I'm going to press pause for a second. I want to open the floor to questions. I think there's a microphone over here. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to come up and ask any of our panel. Any takers? Please come forward and tell us who you are. And thanks for opening this up. I can barely see you with these lights. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, 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 I'll okay. make myself heard. My name is Michael Atala. Uh, uh, this question primarily for you, Jesse. I'm a big fan of Dreambox. I spent a lot of time with early stage founders in the education technology space. And one of the things, this is tangential a little bit to what, you know, something you said earlier about increasing equity and diversity and uh, or increasing equity in K-12 in order to improve outcomes from a leadership perspective over time and education over time. Uh, one of the things during your introduction that made me cringe was the statement that you raised money by an impact investor. Um, and I think... By a what? I'm sorry? An impact investor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that you've proven, your company among others, have proven that ed education technology companies can have it play a huge role in changing educational outcomes, particularly for a diverse student base. But the problem is the companies that are out there trying to make that happen are often relegated to finding an impact investor. Instead, instead of the many VCs and bankers in this room who invest in companies that are seen as far more profitable. I'm, I'm curious what you see um, as the current state of investment and banking and, and, and fundraising for education technology specifically and whether there's a trend in the right direction or wrong direction or, um, or something that the industry as a whole should do to repair that. Um, such, or if you disagree with me, I suppose as well. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, when we went through our round, our la la latest round, we had 13 suitors and one of them was an impact investment fund. And we went with the RISE Fund for three reasons. The first is that they were as committed to making sure that what we did together impacted student academic progression. Demonstrable, measurable student academic progression. There were most of the other investors, they were interested in ed tech because it's kind of sexy now. It's actually sexy in K-12. For a long time, it was only higher ed. Right. And K-12, we were, you know, the Rodney Dangerfields of, of, of the investment community. So then it became sexy. But what they weren't focused on was actually having an impact on learning. And so if I have to convince uh, an investor that an impact on learning is really important and integral to success, not secondary, but as important as high growth, then I know what kind of conversations I'm going to have with my board right. after the transaction. So the first was impact. They had the most sophisticated model for measuring impact, generational impact, and they scored Dreambox. So they knew, I knew that they knew that we were special because we got the highest score that they have ever um, measured. The second reason was because there were times over the past five years that I got calls from ministers of education or somebody in uh, APAC. Dreambox, we know Dreambox, we need Dreambox, and we didn't have the global infrastructure to do it. 
I had to say no to kids and I had to say no to teachers because we didn't have the um, operational readiness for that. And this fund had a stated objective to make sure that the innovations that we had were brought to global communities with a special focus on underserved communities, and that resonated with me. And then the third was just a pragmatic. They have a very long history of taking high growth companies and helping them to scale. And we all know in this room that the things that help you get to where you are, where you can land $130 million, is not the, are not the same skills that get you to the next phase. And they have a really um, long tradition and a great track record track record of investing, not eliminating exp expenses, but investing in those companies so that they can soar. So we have found the right partner, and I do believe that it's important to get a lot of smart money and smart talent into this space, because these, this is one of the critical things that is gonna shape our shared future, education and, and access to education for all. There are things around the climate, there are things about healthcare, and they're focused on education, healthcare, and environmental sustain sustainability. That was a good match for Dreambox Learning. Thank you, Jesse. Any other questions? All right, we have a few minutes. Oh, one I here. saw someone coming to the mic, so please, I'm sorry, too. I didn't mean to cut you off. Someone on the other side, ma'am. Yes. I can't see anything up here. Okay, Hi. go ahead. My name is Jody Laughlin. I'm the Dean of Business and Information Technology at Bellevue College, and I'm the one with the whiplash from nodding so hard during your panel discussion, so I want to thank all three of you. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on something that's been a huge mission and obstacle uh, for, for me and for my division faculty and students for many years. And uh, it goes back towards, and I can't remember which of you said, um, talked about the risk taking when it comes to recruitment and diversity, uh, especially in the tech sector, which is where I'm heavily involved. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult, especially as a four-year community college, um, encouraging the tech sector to come in and kind of take that risk, break that mold, and come and recruit uh, from our baccalaureate programs, which are applied baccalaureate programs, uh, because it's different and it's new. But fewer than 40% of our students identify as white. So we have a tremendous amount of diverse students, and we have over 60% of our students are women. So I hear a lot of tech employers saying, oh, how do we get more diversity into our workforce? Well, that may involve taking some risks and going and recruiting. One can still recruit from the same universities and the same uh, maybe overseas um, destinations that one always goes to, but also maybe considering some other places to recruit from. Um, but another thing that so what is your question? Um, so another thing that we've discovered, and I'm wondering if this is something that you've considered as well, as a lot of our students don't want to work for certain companies because they hear that once a diversity hire is hired, the company does not create a very welcoming atmosphere. So yes, they'll hire diversity, but there's not a welcoming atmosphere for people of whatever their background is. Uh, do you find that companies are taking the time to create a corporate culture of welcome for diverse uh, employees, um, where it doesn't just stop at the diversity hire, but that the company takes, takes the time to create a safe and welcoming uh, corporate culture for all people who work there? I'm going to um, take this very briefly because I represent 2,600 companies. And when I first started my career, diversity was a really big, scary word, and every diversity community Every diversity committee was made up of people who look just like me. And I would say, well, I'm not the one who needs to be here to have this conversation. I would say now, it's pretty standard procedure for people to talk about their DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion planning. Now, you can talk about wanting to have a plan, but then the question is, how do you live up to that? What does your what does leadership look like in your organization? And what kind of culture and environment are you creating if you're asking people to be part of this? And I think to your point earlier, Jesse, it's not my responsibility to feel like, how do I fit in? How does the organization itself open their arms and welcome me? So I, that, that's my answer, but I'll let Jesse and Anamari well, jump in. Well, I think it's part of what Jesse and I were talking about before is we've got to get um, companies and work settings 
um, to realize that diversity is part of excellence, yeah. that it's not just a civic obligation, that it's not just a moral good, right. not that there's anything just about moral good or civic right. obligations, but that this really is part of excellence. Um, I think we also have to find ways outside, you know, because sometimes there does have to be the first. I mean, when I think about, for example, the, the, you know, the women uh, in academia who came before me, it was much more uncomfortable for them than it is for me, and I hope it will be even more comfortable for the women who come after me, people of color immigrants that come after me. And so we have to also find other ways to support people if they are working in an environment that's not comfortable because you know, once you have someone there, they can reach back and pull in others. So you know, I, I think it, it has to be both, that we have to get, um, understand companies, why they have to change. And quite frankly, you just look at the demographics of the US, and you have to change um, if you're going to stay excellent. But also, how do we support those people that are the trailblazers um, outside of the work environment? And we have to change the narrative that this is a risk. Because one of the things you hear sometimes, like, well, I want to have a more diverse workforce, and I want to have a more diverse leadership, but I need the most qualified people first, as though those two are mutually exclusive. And so I think, there, again, there's a culture and a mindset that we have to be responsible for changing, especially those of us in leadership. You, you're happy to be the first, but you never want to be the last. Jesse? The, the quick thing I would just say is, on the belongingness piece that you're talking about, it's one thing to get them to the table. It's another thing to make sure they're heard when they speak. It's another thing to make them feel comfortable when they're there. So instead of trying to guess what they need, ask them, what do you need to feel more supported and to be more successful? Ask them. They'll tell you. Well, the other thing I'll add is that when you make an environment more, ex more inclusive for any group, it's better for every group. And, and I'll, give, I'll give an example in academia. Um, we ended up, and universities around the country, making it easier to extend the tenure clock, largely thinking about women having children. Um, first of all, now it's fabulous because more and more men want to be involved in, in child rearing, so it makes the environment more attractive to them. But also, we've seen both men and women um, use the ability to extend the tenure clock to, let's say, take some time off and get involved in a startup. And so making that environment more flexible, even though what you had in mind was one particular group, it helped everybody. And so building more inclusive environments that provide more flexibility for different kinds of lifestyles, et cetera, is actually good for everybody, not just the quote unquote diverse population. Yeah, and, and the diverse candidates who enter the workplace, you know, we, we're not all a project, but at the same time, <laughs> there has to be a culture of inclusion so that it feels natural and that yes, you do belong here. So we have time for one more question. Thank you for that question, that was really good. Yeah, my, my question is for Anamari, and I hate to put you on the spot, but you've talked a lot about diversity and I absolutely agree with everything you've said and I you know, celebrate obviously what you're saying. My question to you is about political diversity, right? Because at the University of Washington, for instance, there's this controversy right now with Cliff Mass, and he's a climatologist and professor who's written about climate change and supports man-made global warming, but um, you know, maybe the world doesn't end in 12 years. The problem is the faculty's kind of really attacked him, and what we're seeing is there's not this kind of openness to different political thoughts as there is to diversity of you know, social and economic scales and skin colors and things like that. So how do you, how do you encourage political diversity and thought diversity and academic freedom in a scenario like you dug? Well, you know, first of all, I want to say, you know, it would be inappropriate and unprofessional for me to speak about a faculty personnel decision. So I'm not going to get into, into the specifics of, of that situation, although I, I will point out that uh, he is speaking quite freely. Um, and that's a good thing. I mean, I do think that, that academic freedom is absolutely fundamental. If you look over time, sometimes some of the best discoveries and ideas come from people that at the moment were viewed as heretics. And we have to create that kind of environment where even you know, opinions that may seem unpopular um, can thrive. I have stood up again and again for freedom of speech. Um, I have had, as, as some of you know, a lot of people come at me very hard yeah. when we stood up and said, hey, Milo Yiannopoulos is going to speak on campus and we need to create a space where he can speak. Um, we've had Joey Gibson on campus. We've had a range of speakers from a broad range of 
political backgrounds on campus, and we will continue to do so. I think it is absolutely critical. When I say that diversity is critical to excellence, that does include different political views, et cetera. Right now in Seattle, I think it's less about the University of Washington, but I think in Seattle at times we are in a bit of a bubble, mm -hmm. and that it really is important for us to break out of that a bit and understand that sometimes positions that may seem um, that, 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 that may seem hard to understand from an urban environment. You know, an example can be, you know, in, 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 uh, in rural environments, a lot of people grew up thinking about guns as part of hunting with their fathers. And, you know, and, and that, you know, it, it's very different than in an urban environment where you think of guns in terms of violence. And that we do have to try and get out of ourselves and view things from a different perspective. But there is absolutely no question that at our university, we stand up for freedom of speech and academic freedom. No question about it. Now, I, I will state, I came to this country. Some of you know I'm an immigrant from Cuba. My parents brought me to this country first and foremost because of the freedoms that we have here. And the last thing I'm going to do is take that away from anybody else. All right, well, I want to thank this very, very esteemed panel here for sharing your thoughts about tech, about business, about education. I would say the punchline is that diversity, equity, and inclusion does not mean that you're compromising quality or values. It makes your organization stronger. It's how you stay relevant in the 21st century. And I would say that Anamari and Jesse exemplified those values every single day. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause.